OK, so um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we have 22 attendees from the UN, which is a good thing for the first office hours. We're happy to have you here. Um, so today we're going to uh, discuss a couple of stuff, uh, mainly for uh, introduction to how to navigate the AWS platform, how to understand uh, some of the services that we're going to be using during the datathon, especially um, some of the most common ones. But before we go ahead and jump uh, right in, we want to introduce ourselves, right? So we want you guys to get to know us because we're going to be here every single Wednesday from today on until the datathon happens. So I want to start uh, by giving the, the floor to my colleague Isol first, and then I go ahead and introduce myself. Thank you, Danieski. Hello, everyone. My name is Ezel Mohammed, a uh, solutions architect here for the United Nations and the World Bank Group. Um, I'm currently based in Dallas, Texas, and I've been with the company for about a year and 11 months now. So I have um, quite a little bit of experience now <laughs> within AWS. Uh, I specialize in serving the public sector and also collaborating with our uh, teams internally and giving technical guidance and architecture designs and solutions. Also uh, helping out, you know, institutions and universities giving technical guidance. So um, I also have a background in computer science, so. But I'm really happy to be a part of this datathon just to uh, learn, show you guys the art of the possible within for data analytics. So pass it on to uh, colleague Danieski. OK, so my name is Danieski Otano. Uh, every time that I introduce myself, I always say plus one to Easel because we've had the same, almost the same trajectory in AWS. Not before AWS, but uh, same thing. So I'm, I'm also a solutions architect for the UN, um, joined the UN about six months ago. And I've been with the company for almost two years now um, for the with, working with the public sector. I have, have a background in software engineering and also computer science. And uh, I used to be an instructor, English instructor for 11 years. And then I became an instructor for AWS. And then I joined the company uh, as a solutions architect. I'm based out of Miami, Florida. I used to be in Texas, but now I'm in Miami. So the Sunshine State. Enjoying the sun here and the weather. And uh, I'm pretty happy to be here, uh, folks, uh, and help you understand a little bit more about AWS and what uh, uh, what you can do with it, right? So uh, with no further ado, I would like to uh, start. Can I say something, my if you don't mind? Go ahead, Sean. I just wanted to give a little background if, for those of you who are new to the Hackathon uh, briefly. Yeah. So. I'm Sean. I work with the United Nations. Um, this the the datathon that that's taking place uh, in about a month is going to uh, involve many different platforms, uh, four different platforms. And so our partners at AWS are one of the core uh, in you know partners that we have. Uh, and they've been with us uh, in in past hackathons, uh, datathons, and we're we're very grateful for their support. So they've agreed to do these office hours as a means of ensuring that. The participants in the hackathon who are using AWS uh, can sort of hit the ground running, uh, get access to the necessary materials in advance because it is, you know, a time limited uh, event. And so, you know, the more preparation you have in terms of learning going in, the, the more success you're you're likely to have during the event. So, um, I just wanted to say thank you to Dineski and Ezel for for doing this. Uh, it's very generous of them. So, I, I hope um, I just want to. Give it back to them, but I just wanted to give that brief orientation about you know where this situates. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. So we want to we want to make sure that everything goes smoothly on the day of the on the days of the hackathon or datathon. So uh, we're gonna try to uh, pave the way, right? Pave the way for everything to go well on that on those days from the third to the sixth. So let me go ahead and share my screen, and I will turn my camera off. Uh, for bandwidth, right? So just let me know. Give me a thumbs up in the chat, or um, so the way you want, guys. So let me know that you can see my screen, please. Yeah, we can see it, Danielski. Okay, That's good, good, good. 
So we're going to start with a presentation today um, on some of the stuff that we're going to be covering during the, uh, the uh, datathon. And then I'm going to give the uh, opportunity to Easel, uh, my colleague, to go ahead and uh, give some sort of a demo so you guys can see it in action, everything that we're going to be talking about uh, during my presentation. Okay, so we're going to be talking about cloud computing with AWS. Um, we, we wanted to give you a rough introduction of AWS and uh, some of the stuff that you, be, you should be aware of uh, before you go ahead and, and work with uh, Amazon Web Services. So uh, the agenda for today, I'm going to show it to you after, well, you already know us, we introduce ourselves, but these are the two essays or solutions architects that are, um, supporting you today, Tunis Kiotano and Izo Mohammed. okay? Now, the agenda for today is the following. So we're going to be talking first about uh, what AWS Cloud is, right? Then we're going to be jumping into the AWS Global Infrastructure. We're going to be talking about regions and uh, availability zones, and also some of the regions that are coming up that are, that are, that are in the plan, in the works, and AWS will launch soon and also some of the availability zones as well that are gonna be launched uh, in the ne near future. Also, we're gonna be kind of uh, taking a look at most of, or the most popular AWS uh, data analytics services that uh, you guys are gonna be using in the um, Datathon as well as the AI ML services. And we're going to be uh, talking about the AWS Management Console, and that's something that uh, Izo is going to uh, walk you through. Uh, talking about three ways to access the AWS services, and also we're going to be uh, showing you uh, maybe the access during the Radathon, what you need to do, and discussing a little bit about the open data registry, which you guys will be using in the datathon and give you some tutorial recommendations uh, so that you can uh, get prepped for, for uh, the datathon. Uh, if you if you feel like, if you have questions, just don't hesitate to interrupt me during my presentation and I'm here to help you and we'll do our best to answer your questions. So what is AWS? Basically, uh, well, like in any cloud computing uh, provider, cloud computing is the on-demand uh, delivery of IT resources over the internet with pay-as-you-go pricing. So that's that's typical for every single cloud provider. Now, instead of buying, owning, and maintaining physical data centers and servers, you can access services such as computing, storage and databases whenever you need it. Now, some people use an, an analogy. They, when they think about cloud computing, they think about a utility bill, like gas, water, electricity. So if you use it, you pay for it. If you don't use it, you don't pay for it. So you pay, pay, pay as you go, right? And also, specifically for Amazon Web Services, it provides a reliable, scalable, and, and low-cost infrastructure platform in the cloud uh, that powers millions, uh, millions of businesses in over 254 countries and geographical areas around the world. So some of the benefits is uh, agility, for example. So teams can experiment and in over innovate quickly and frequently. So you don't have to worry about procuring or obtaining hardware anymore. So AWS takes, takes care of that, right? Also, capacity planning is, is way easier now since you can right-size what you need and launch resources in minutes. Elasticity is another benefit. So you can stop guessing capacity. So it means that you don't have to think, am I over-provisioned? Am I under-provisioned, right? So you can scale resources as needed and even with automation. And... And uh, like I said, you don't work uh, with hardware, so you don't have to work with uh, about provisioning uh, servers and any of that, right, manually. Now, security is very important as well. So that's another, another benefit. It means that uh, you 
can be secure in the AWS cloud. Now, security is a top priority for AWS. That's something that we always say. And AWS is architected to be the most flexible and secure computing environment available today. So our core infrastructure is built to satisfy the security requirements for military, global banks, and other highly sensitive organizations. And last but not least, global footprint. So with our global footprint, you can deploy your application in multiple regions around the world. This means that you can provide lower latency and better experience for your customers or for your workloads. And I also explain in more detail about global footprints and the geographic regions we currently support in, a, in, a, in another slide. Now, um, AWS support virtually any cloud workload, right? We've been, we've been prepared for that because we understand that uh, some customers uh, come from different cloud providers and some customers, they have multi-cloud environments. So AWS is prepared for that. So we have core services and the core services, we have compute, storage, networking, databases, right? And, and, and the infrastructure is comprised of regions which are geographical uh, uh, locations around the world and also availability zones, which are uh, part of the regions, right? So a region um, at least has two availability zones for high availability, right? We also have services for uh, security and compliance management tools, and we have 600 uh, plus types of compute instances. So when we talk about instances, we're talking about servers, virtual servers. So we can, we can, you can choose um, from 600 plus uh, compute instances, the capacity, I would say, right? Also, uh, we have 200 uh, and plus fully uh, featured services that encompass all this Categories, I would say, application development, analytics, media, so on and so forth, like you see here in, in, in the screen, right? So AWS also has the deepest functionality within those services. For example, AWS offers the widest variety of databases that are purpose-built for different types of applications, so you can choose the right tool for the job to get the best cost and performance, right? So these are some of the things that uh, um, AWS can offer. Now, like I said before, I said that I would talk about the global infrastructure. And, um, and, and we mentioned availability zones before. So like I said, each region is comprised by at least two availability zones, right? And, and, and like I said before as well, it's, it's, it's an isolated geographical area right? Physically, se physically separated, right? And the ACs are physically separated as well. So between ACs, we have around 60 miles. So AWS has, has studied the area, right? And make sure that the ACs are separated uh, far apart, just in case there's an earthquake or maybe a natural disaster or something. It doesn't affect multiple AZs, right? And um, now each AZ is comprised by one or more data centers, right? And these data centers, uh, they have redundant, redundant power, networking connectivity, right? And uh, each data center is comprised by 50 to 80,000 servers. So uh, that's the way that the AWS infrastructure is laid out. So we have regions at this moment. We have 32 regions across the world. We have 102 availability zones, and each availability zone has at least one uh, data center, and each data center has at least uh, 50 to 80,000 servers. So all these availability zones, they have high throughput, low latency, so it takes about 10 milliseconds uh, to, to communicate between them, right? And all the traffic between them is encrypted. So customers, they don't have to worry about the encryption. How secure is the traffic between those AZs, right? So those are details about uh, the availability zone. So we have here one region. This region is the US East 1. This is a code 
and ESO will walk you through this later, the regions that we have at this moment in the AWS. This is the Northern Virginia region, which is the oldest one. So when AWS was founded in 2006, this was the first region that existed, right? And then inside we have three availability zones. And by the way, this region has six availability zones available, but you can use as many as you want uh, within six, right? After six. But AWS always recommends to have at least two so that you can be highly available. Just in case one re one availability zone goes down, right? And you has you still have the second one to uh, cope with the the failure, right? And usually regions they have uh, availability zones. I'm sorry, they have the code of the region plus a letter, so it's usually A B C. Right, E F uh, D E F. Right, so usually uh, following the alphabet, uh, but uh, typically uh, a region has three. But Northern Virginia is the oldest one; it has six availability zones. Right. Now let's look a look at the map. This is the current map of the regions uh, in AWS. So this is the global presence of AWS. We have 102 AZs or availability zones. We have 32 regions across the world. So the ones, the dot, you see the circles here, the one that are blue, light blue, they are regions that are, exist right now. But the ones that we see in red are the ones that are coming soon, right? So we have um, four more regions announced. That's gonna be in Canada, Malaysia, New Zealand, and Thailand. And we have uh, 12 more availability zones uh, announced as well. Now we also have uh, 550 points of presence. What is a points of presence? They are called edge locations or regional edge caches. So edge locations are locations that our CDN, uh, Content Delivery Network, Amazon CloudFront uses to cache the data for lower latency and that's an edge location so the, the data is cached there and it's used later to deliver it to uh the the end users and regional edge caches are for the less ac frequently accessed data so edge location the most frequently accessed data regional caches for the less uh commonly frequently uh data so that's that's uh the core infrastructure of AWS. AWS is constantly creating new um, regions, announcing new ones, availability zones. Um, I remember that uh, about six months ago, there were 415 plus points of presence. And today, as you can see, we have 550, right? So they're, they're constantly uh, making the life of our customers uh, easier uh, by creating new regions and availability zones. Any questions so far before I continue? Any questions? Uh, feel free to ask questions. Okay. Uh, okay. So we have a hands, uh, hand this phrase. Um, go ahead. Um, how do you pronounce your name? Cresto? Yeah, I think you're mute. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so there's someone with the, with the red hand raised, but I'm not sure if they want to ask something or by mistake they raised their hand. Well, um, okay. I, yeah, so I think participants are automatically muted. So uh, okay, okay, oh, okay, okay. We need to unmute them. Uh, that makes sense. That makes sense. May, no, they can actually unmute themselves now. I believe. So uh, the person who yeah. raised the hand can, if you want to, uh, Mike is disabled. Okay, let me take care of that. Give me one okay. second. If you folks don't want to um, say aloud, you can post your question in the chat and is a way to take care of that. But like I said before, feel free to interrupt me. So it says, Crystal says that you cannot hear me. So it seems that probably has having some issues with the uh, the mic. The mic, okay. 
So let's move on. Okay, uh, feel free, Krista, to ask your question whenever you want. So um, let's talk briefly about some of the services that are going to be featuring in in the uh, data fund and for which we're going to give you permissions so that you can work on your workloads and um, utilize them as you please. So this is a modern data analytics reference architecture in AWS uh, using a lake house, right? They're talking about data lakes. Um, I was wondering if I can see only one data center of AWS in Africa. Does that affect the speed of the service and accessibility for the rest of Africa? Okay, Denise, um, there's only one region at the moment, there's one region in Africa, and that is Cape Town, right? And that's something that is when you walk, walk you uh, uh, folks through the AWS Management Console, he can show you uh, the different regions that are, there are in AWS, but there are other regions. It depends on what location in Africa um, a person is, but there are regions in Israel, and, and there's regions in other countries that are close to Africa as well. So it depends in your you are in the north, northern Africa or southern Africa or in the middle Africa. So, um, so that's that depends. But if you're in the South Africa, you can use Cape Town. If you're in Northern African, you can use um, other regions that are maybe here, right? These regions here. So this is Israel. There's one here. There's Italy, as well, and in in uh, Milan in Italy, and the other regions in here that you can utilize for for this uh, the uh, the north of Africa. Maybe in the middle you can use uh, Cape Town, which is here. Okay. I know uh, AWS is working on creating more. So this is something that uh, is in the plans, but. Uh, um so it, it there there are also availability zones here in this region that you can utilize and uh, and uh, for lower latency as well so that's that's in africa at the moment but always customers can use other regions as well for for lower latencies uh it's better to have one that is close to you so uh, now you guys can unmute yourself. So uh, if you want to speak, please raise your hand and and, and we can discuss uh, whatever concerns you have. Good. So um, this is a modern um, a modern architecture, uh, reference architecture of uh, data analytics. So we have services here, right? And we have the sources. So the sources can be, it can be a NoSQL database or SQL database on premises, maybe a file share that you may have and uh, devices or maybe logs in your servers or maybe social media or maybe uh, videos or, or maybe a SaaS applications. So you can have multiple, way, multiple ways to ingest that data. Uh, fortunate, um, this is something that I don't know at the moment, uh, but this is something that probably is, or can you take that if there's any plans to, uh, can you take it down in the notes? If there's any plans so that you can find out later to create more data centers in Africa. Sure. Okay, so we don't have that information at the moment, fortunate, uh, unfortunately, but, uh, we can find that out, see if there's any plans for that. Okay. Um, we can share and connect different virtual machines and ACs under the same region, but cannot do the same if they are. Oh, of course you can, Crystal. There's there's a, a cross region replication, there's cross regions connect, connections. There's disaster recovery plans. You can have. Uh, it depends on the strategy that you choose. You can have a workload in one region and a replication of that region of that workload in a different region. So that, those are things that you can accomplish in AWS. They have uh, a multi-region deployment. Yes, yes, uh, Chukua, uh, 
most of the things that 90% of the things that AWS features and services that AWS creates are based on uh, customers' feedback, right? So, you know, customers, they they ask for it, AWS uh, analyzes it, discusses it, and then go ahead, goes ahead, and uh, if there's a chance, they go ahead and, and do it for our customers. So, but it's basically based on demand and, and request from, from customers, right? Sorry about that. So, um, so there are multiple ways to ingest the, uh, the data. So you can use AWS data migration service. This is a service that helps us, that helps us ingest the data from databases. So you can connect your on-premise databases with uh, the cloud and, and, and move, migrate the workload uh, using database migration service. And the good thing about this is that you can do it only one time or you can do it or on ongoing uh, basis, right? And 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 be able to uh, track whatever you're doing. There's also data sync, and this is a, a service that helps us uh, move data from from cloud other cloud providers to AWS, from on-premise to AWS, from a service in AWS to another service in AWS, and even from AWS to on-premises, and um, we also have Amazon Kinesis, and this is uh, a data analytics uh, real time or near real time service that allows us to ingest data from multiple sources as well. And, and we have the ability to uh, deliver the data to a destination. Uh, it could be an S3 bucket, and we're going to be talking about S3 as well in our presentation today, which is one of the services are going to be featuring in the datathon. We can have, if we have any workloads for Apache Kafka, we can, we have another service called Amazon Managed Streaming for Apache Kafka, also known as MMSK, that can help with that. IoT Core for, for IoT uh, workloads and Amazon AppFlow, just in case you have any as SaaS applications, you can go ahead and move the data using Amazon uh, AppFlow. And Data Exchange, which uh, ESO is going to talk about a little bit today as well. And this is used for integrating third-party data into a data lake, right? And when we talk about data lakes, uh, we talk about S3. That's, it's, that's the uh, preferred, preferred uh, storage solution uh, for data lakes. Okay, in AWS, so Amazon, Amazon Simple Storage Service, also known as, known as Amazon S3. S3 because it has three S's, Simple Storage Service, S3. It's an easier way to call it, right? We're going to be talking about it uh, later in another slide. And then we have Lake Formation, which is kind of a um, unified governance service that helps you um, from a centralized way. Uh, to secure access, uh, control the access, and also audit the trails. Whatever happens with that data lake, lake formation can uh, uh, work with it and make sure that you have the right permissions, you have the right access, and everything that you need. We also have um, Amazon or AWS Glue, which is an ETL or an extract, load, and uh, transform uh data service and this will help us uh, uh crawl the data from a data source in this case s3 as we said before and uh transform it to uh, do some analytics uh analysis and be able to transform the data if you want to remove uh, maybe a drop uh, a column of the table maybe you want to change a data type maybe want to do some uh analytics on it so you can use AWS Glue, and also you can use AWS Glue Data Brew as well um, for visual data preparation. So some of the things that you can do, and ESO is going to be walking you through today, um, some of the things that you can do with AWS Glue and S3. Because in every office hours, we're going to talk about a service or two. Today, we're going to talk about Amazon S3 as we have the preparation all of this introduction plus S3, we, we won't have time to cover another service. But uh, 
S3 is, going to, uh, is the one that we're going to be covering today with AWS Glue. Um, we have uh, other services that we can use for analytics, and they that is in the family, in the Kinesis family. So we have uh, data analytics, Kinesis data analytics, and then we have uh, Amazon QuickSight. You want to visualize the data with different uh, uh, visuals like a pie chart or a bar chart or um, PKI, whatever you want to do with uh, visualization, you can use QuickSight for that, open search as well, if you want to kind of index that data and do some search on it, right, for operational analysis and analytics, right? And uh, we have Redshift as a warehousing solution that AWS can offer. And uh, we have EMR for, um, Elastic map reduce uh, is is what EMR stands for. That's for Hadoop and Hive uh, workloads. It provides cloud big data platform for processing vast amounts of data. You be using open source uh, tools, so you can accomplish pretty much the same with EMR as you do with uh, Glue. Um, uh, you know, but EMR is more for Hadoop, all that, and 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 it uses servers. Uh, Glue is serverless. So one of the advantages of using Glue, you don't have to manage servers. And then we have um, a machine learning service, SageMaker, uh, which is used to build, train, and deploy ML models and add intelligence to your application. So that's that's a service that you guys are going to have access to. And that is something that we're going to cover in other obvious hours. We also have Amazon Redshift Spectrum, and this is for querying the data. Right, using SQL SQL like uh, uh, language to be able to, to query the data from uh, S3, for example, and we also have Amazon Athena, which is uh, a query engine as well, and this is serverless that you can utilize to uh, query, analyze, and process uh, process process data. So these are uh, some of the services. We still have more services that work in uh, in that are in the analytics space. But these are the most common ones and the ones that you're going to be using in the in the data fund. Now we also have AI ML services, and uh, so we see here the machine learning as a um, machine learning stack having three layers. So in the bottom layer um, are the frameworks and infrastructure for those comfortable building and maintaining their own machine learning platform and on the line infrastructure. So the bottom layer is for more advanced uh, machine learning users. And when you're comfortable building and maintaining those ML models, right? And uh, in the middle layer are the machine learning services that make it easy for machine learning developers um, and data scientists to build, train and deploy machine learning models in a single click with Amazon SageMaker. In addition to uh, the integrated development environment, all Amazon SageMaker features are available through APIs. So the other features that Amazon uh, SageMaker has, right? This is just a rough overview of Amazon SageMaker, but these are, just understand that Amazon SageMaker is a service that will help you will help you uh, build and train your models. It's for users are comfortable with machine learning platforms, right? And with their, their own platform and uh, models. And then in the top layer, we have the AI services that allow all developers to use pre-trained and auto-trained models to add intelligence to any application without machine learning expertise. So the, the, these are services that you can use. For example, Amazon recognition, right? You can uh, tell Amazon recognition what you want and they would train the model for you, right? Maybe you want to detect the face in a video. You want to detect the face in, in an image. You want to detect a person or maybe an object or maybe an animal, right? You can use that. Uh, you can use Amazon Poly as well to translate or to transcribe from text to to speech, right? And then you can use Amazon Transcribe 
to uh, turn speech into text. So you can use these two services um, to, to transform your, 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 your data, right? You also have Amazon Comprehend that will help you with uh, sentiment analysis. You want to check if a person is sad or maybe a text uh, has some uh, speech that is not acceptable. Can someone mute their mic if it is possible? Uh, Janeska, I think I muted you um, in an attempt to mute everyone. So if you don't mind, uh, maybe unmute yourself and continue. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, no, you're good. You're good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So maybe you want to know if a person is sad or a person is happy, or maybe you want to know if a test contains negative uh, information or probably, probably hate speech or bad, uh, I don't know. That's something that uh, conveys a sentiment, right? That's for Amazon Comprehend. And we bought both transcribe medical and comprehend medical for medical uh, institutions, right? That you can use this as well. So we have Amazon Trans, and by the way, Amazon Transcribe, um, last time I checked, is AWS is constantly, uh, so we, we almost never can say, an, an exact number because AWS is constantly uh, creating new stuff. But last time I checked, it has 34 languages that it supports. Amazon Transcribe. And we have another service called Amazon Translate, and this would translate from a target, from a target, sorry, from a source language into a target language. Um, Amazon Testrat, this would track text from a text from, from a specific video or, or image. Amazon Lex will work with chatbots. If you want to have a chatbot for your website, you can use Amazon Lex. Amazon Personalize is for campaigns and personalization. Just, uh, you know, sometimes when uh, an e-commerce website has, um, has uh, a website, right? Has a website and then um, you want to kind of uh, recommend products that are hot or uh, purchased frequently, you can send an email to a specific uh, set of a built group of customers and and tell give them some recommendation based on what they have purchased in the past. So that's for personalized. So this is a, a service that utilizes um, machine learning in the background. So you don't have to know machine learning for this. You just uh, provide personalized with the data, right? Uh, you can connect it to a database. And then uh, you can you can see the database. What are the items that are mostly purchased? And then personally, we'll send the uh, you can uh, we'll, we'll analyze that data uh, using machine learning. And also, uh, it's going to connect to another service that sends emails, which is um, Pinpoint Amazon Pinpoint, which is not a, 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 in the scope of this presentation, but uh, these services they integrate with other services to send campaign emails. So, so someone described AWS as an spaghetti bowl because everything is interrelated somewhere, some way, uh, somehow, and, and, and we have integration with other services. We also have forecasting. Well, forecasting based on the data that you uh, analyze, you can forecast what's going to happen in the future. Who's going to purchase this? I mean, how many products we can sell about? how many um, samples we can sell of this product. Fraud detection, well, it says it all. It's just um, you want to detect fraud, right? And for that, uh, you can uh, utilize this service. Amazon Cloud Code Guru, this is when you want to analyze your code, right? And you can use this uh, service. Uh, it supports Java and Python at the moment, but you can use it in your code and scan your code for um, maybe some box or something that, that may be wrong with your with your uh, programming uh, application, right? And uh, we also have Content Lens. This is for sorry about that uh, Content Lens, and this is for Amazon Connect, which is uh, 
a virtual um, call center that AWS also offers. And uh, so this is an overview of that, uh, of, of machine learning. Um, so you will be using this. Uh, I mean, uh, a datathon, you don't, you're not instructed to use a specific service. So you're gonna have all the permissions that you need and then you can utilize whatever service you need for, for, your, for, your, uh, for your workload, right? But we just give you an overview. We're gonna cover uh, SageMaker in another, in another, uh, like I said before, in another office hours, and then you have a, you're gonna have a better idea of how SageMaker works. And with the SageMaker, you can use uh, notebooks for for machine learning uh, and training models. Right. Now uh, we have uh, three ways to access so the services. So uh, whenever you want to interact with your with the AWS platform, there's three main ways, right? And the main way is the management console, right? So you have a root user, right? And this is the user that is created by default when you uh, create your account. You create your, your, your AWS account, a root user is created. So for that new user, you're gonna use your email and password, right? Now, you can, you, you can create IAM users. IAM stands for Identity and Access Management User. So that is something that uh, is best practices uh, to create, right? So um, what AWS recommends is for uh, daily, daily, daily uh, basis or day-to-day -day operations is not to use the user for anything, right? Why? Because if someone gets your credentials as a root user, you're going to be in trouble, right? You know, your user, your user has all the permissions in that account. Now, what AWS recommends is to use um, to create an IAM user, just like you do in your um, Active Directory, if you're using it, create a user, attach a policy to, the, policy to the user, an administrator policy, for example, and then use the IAM user for day-to-day -day operations, right? Now, an administrator doesn't have all the permissions. It's just an administrator. The root user is the one that has all the uh, permissions. For the IAM user, you have to use the account number or alias. You need to have that data with you, that piece of data, the account uh, number or alias, and then you will use your username and password. So who, create, who creates an IAM user? Well, administrator, right? So uh, we have the command line interface. So for this, you create the IAM user, or the root user, and you're gonna be provided with access keys, right? And those are the keys, which is an access key and a secret access key. You have to uh, provide this in the command line interface, which is in your computer, either using PowerShell or using Mac, a terminal in Mac or in Linux, right? You have to provide those, those keys to be able to access the AWS services. You don't need to log in when you use your command line interface. And another way is the SDK. So SDK is the software developer kit, right? And this is when you use an, an, a text editor, like uh, maybe uh, Sublime, Eclipse, maybe you're using Visual, Visual Studio, VS Code. Uh, then you have to provide the access keys as well but you are accessing your services from a different platform, not from a CLI, right? So you can have SDKs for mobile applications, for web development, cloud computing. This is the one that we are referring to today and internet of things and gate development. So you can use the SDKs for that, right? So these are the three ways that you can access uh, the, uh, the AWS services. So, um, is are we taking care of the questions in the chat? Yeah, Deniski. Yeah, that's, that's good. good. Yes, 
Good. So uh, the registry open data on AWS. So this is something that you guys will be using during the data fund. It's called also called Rhoda, the registry open data on AWS. And Isa will talk more about this, right? This is what it looks like when you land in this particular page, registry that open data AWS, right? So you can go ahead and Isa will tell you how to access the data, right? But this is what it looks like, right? And um, if you folks like, we can share this presentation um, in a PDA format when we finish the data, the, the, uh, be it the office hours today. So for you guys can have a reference and see, uh, kind of where you can save this um, in, 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 in your computers and have it there. So Rhoda would allow you to search for data sets by keyword and tags for common types of data, such as genomic, satellite imagery and transportation if you have data that you would like to put into the registry you can do you can do so by adding adding it via the github and also instruction how to do to add the data and our uh, your contribution guidelines are available right so you have uh Okay, um, these are some of the tutorials that you guys uh, can go over. There are more tutorials, and we're going to be providing this website as well, as you can see here. You can see um, there, there's a there's a decent number of... Uh, can, that person, can someone uh, mute their mic, please? So uh, there's a decent number of tutorials for SageMaker uh, Studio Lab that you guys can use this i just put here four but there are many more and when we share this powerpoint with you guys you can open this uh or maybe you can capture it by taking a screenshot of of this um this is where you can find these uh tutorials as well um good so let's talk a little bit about uh, s3 i'm not i don't i don't want to take too much time. I want to leave some time for uh, Izzo Mohammed to talk about uh, some of the other important stuff here. But we can say that Amazon S3 is an object storage. So we have file storage, we have block storage, and we have object storage, right? So Amazon S3 is virtually unlimited. It's just like a walk-in closet that you walk in and more and more, and it, it is elastic. It grows, 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 right? And it would enable you to store virtually unlimited amounts of data. So data files are stored as objects, right? That's what we call it. So the, the file name disappears, and then we call it object, right? It could be any type of file. It could be a, an MP4, MP3. It could be a PDF. It could be a TXT file. Right. So you place the objects in a bucket. The bucket is the container. Right. And that's that's I would say that the bucket is like a folder. Right. But it's called bucket and it has the image. The image is a bucket. Right. And you define the bucket. You define the name. The name has to be uniquely. It has to be unique across the entire AWS platform. So you cannot use a name that other people have. It has to be unique. Right. Also. Um, the object that you store can vary in size from zero bytes to five terabytes, right? So individual objects cannot be larger than five terabytes. You can store as much, as much total data as you need, but every object has a limit, right? Um, so each object has five consistent characteristics. First, it has a key, right? which is the name that you assign to the object. Let's say sample.txt, that's the key. So you use the object key to retrieve the object. In the, manage cons in the AWS management console, you can create a directory inside a bucket and upload an object to that directory. However, in reality, Amazon S3 does not know about directories so that the key value includes the full path relative to the bucket root. So when you upload an object, it has a path that you can use to find that object. 
Now, objects also include a version ID. A version ID. So each object has a version ID. So in a bucket, a key and a version ID uniquely identify the object. So you will learn more about versioning later and in, in another slide, right? Now the value of the object is the actual content that you store. So the key is the name and the value is the content. So it can be any sequence of bytes. Objects values are immutable, which means that after you upload the object, you can now modify the value. If you want to modify the object, you must make a change outside the Amazon S3 and then re-upload the object. It's an object file, right? That's the difference between object and block. But when you, if you want to make a modification to your object, you have to upload the file again. Uh, you cannot modify the object inside the bucket. You have to, you have to uh, upload it again. Now, objects include metadata, which is this, it's a set of name value pairs that you can use to store information about the object. You can assign metadata, which is referred to as user-defined metadata to your objects in Amazon S3. Amazon S3 also assigns system metadata to those objects, which, is, which it uses for managing objects. Um, what else can we say about S3? Well, there's some benefits about S3 durability, right? It has 11 nines durability. Right. So it means that every year there is a zero point zero 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 one percent chance of losing that object. For example, if you store 10,000 objects on Amazon S3, you can expect to incur a loss of a single object once every 10, 10 million years on average. So Amazon S3 is, is redundant. Right, and it stores that data redundantly in multiple devices across multiple um, facilities. And when you say facilities, you talk about data centers. And when you talk about data centers, you're talking about availability zones. Okay, and you can choose the region where that data is going to re uh, reside in. Now, Amazon S3 sustain is designed to sustain concurrent device failures by quickly detecting and repairing any lost redundancy. Amazon S3 also regularly verifies the integrity of your data by using checksums as well. Now, in terms of um, availability, is 99.99%. It means how quickly you can uh, access the data when you want it. Um, it has a virtually unlimited capacity, so it's scalable. So Amazon S3 has a robust security settings as well. You can encrypt the data. So it's highly performant with a first byte latency that is measured in milliseconds for most storage classes. Right. And we can share, um, and, and, and Iso, can you put it in the notes? We can share uh, some performance design patterns that uh, S3 has as well in the Amazon S3 documentation that we can provide as well. Right. And, and this is this is about the, some of the benefits of uh, S3. Now, the availability that you see there, 99.99, uh, it, it depends on the class that you're choosing. We're talking about standard class, which is the most frequently one, right? You can have about six or seven different classes and the availability will depend on that class as well as the latency, the, uh, the time that it would take to, to, to retrieve the data, right? Now, in terms of securing, securing Amazon S3 bucket and, and objects, right? We have multiple ways to do that. So by default, when you create a bucket, all the objects and the bucket are private, unprotected. So this is, this is applying the, uh, the, 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 the principle of list privilege. We don't want to give public access to someone in S3 unless it is a website, you're hosting a website. If you're hosting a website, uh, you can have it uh, public, but if you are uh, storing sensitive data, you don't want to have the bucket public. You want to have it private, right? So there are some tools for controlling access to Amazon S3 data. You can have pu block public access, which is blocked by default. You cannot block it if you want, right? So you don't want that bucket to be publicly accessible. You can leave it by default. It's, it's, it's blocked, right? You can also have identity and access management policies, right, that you attach to a user 
right? Or to a service so that they can access or interact with S3. You can, you can manipulate that as well. You, you can have like more granular permissions using a bucket policy, which is kind of closer to the bucket than an IAM policy. An IAM policy works like a many more general, more general uh, sense, but they are connected to one another as well. As is a control list, you can have ACLs, which is legacy access control mechanism, right? But you, you can use bucket policies, you can use uh, other stuff. Uh, so AWS use, recommends using something else, not, not ACLs. You can still use them, but it's not highly recommended. You can have S3 access points, right? Which is uh, something that you can configure and kind of give certain permissions to an application, right? Presign URL, this is something that we use very commonly when we send uh, a recording to to uh, a, a customer, for example, we have an immersion day, or we have office hours like this one. So you 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 folks want to record something, and we're using Chime, for example. We have access to that recording. We store the recording in an S3 bucket, and then we can create a pre-signed URL that contains the permissions of the owner of that object, and 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 it would give you some time to download the object to your computer. So for a pre-signed URL, you have to specify an expiration time. The longest you can go is seven days. So you can create that from the console or you can create that from the CLI. And you can create that from the SDKs as well. Why not? And then you provide the link to the customer or to whoever you want to share that file with. And then we have certain time to use it. After that, it's gonna expire. And, and they will not be able to download that, right? And then we can use Trusted Advisor, which is a service that gives us recommendations on how we're doing or how that service is performing uh, in terms of security, cost optimization. But in this case, we're talking about security. And then it does a bucket permission check, right? Which is free, right? And it will tell you if you need to secure the bucket. So this is the Trusted Advisor. Gives you recommendations on certain categories and one of them is security. We have certain uh, general approaches to configuring access, right? So you can leave everything as default, right? And, and the owner is the one that has access to the bucket and the files, right? And this is just the owner. Anyone else, zero access, right? Now you can apply maybe public access, open it, you're hosting a website, like I said before, and then you unblock public access, and then you see the owner has access, and anyone else has access to that, especially for websites, because one of the one of the features that S3 has is website hosting, right? You can host a website in S3 for a, a very uh, low price, right? Or the third pattern is and is uh, the recommended one. If you have sensitive data, is to apply a policy to uh, to the bucket, right? So you can have some control, and then see here we only allow access to the owner and the user A, no user B, right? So you can control the access into the bucket using a bucket policy, or maybe an identity and access management policy, right? So that's that's three different patterns, three different scenarios that you can use to access a bucket, right? Now, a little bit about encryption. You can have server-side encryption or client-side encryption, right? So everything is encoded with a data secret, uh, a secret key, right? And it will make it readable. Uh, so only unreadable. On, only users who have access to that secret key can decode the data. That's, uh, for example, the owner, if you um, create an object, uh, upload an object, and then you encrypt it, you have access to it, right? So that that AWS will manage the key for you, but you, AWS understands that you are the owner of the file, so you don't have to do anything about the keys or anything. It's something that is managed by AWS, right? You can use uh, KMS which is key management service to manage the secret keys. If you want, there's an option, but you can let AWS manage the keys for you 
and you don't have to uh, worry about that, right? Service on encryption uh, is the default option. Now, when you create an object, is it's already encrypted by default. You can unencrypt it if you want, right? And it will encrypt the data uh, before uh, uh, is saved to objects uh, to the disk. It encrypts the data and it will decrypt it when you download them, right? Same as encryption, you can make sure that the data is encrypted before it's uploaded in S3, right? That's something that you can force with policies and make sure that the header of the request that brings the data that is sent to the bucket contains a specific header, uh, making sure that the data is encrypted, right? And of course, it will check the encryption of the data, of course, because you can you can invent or you can make up a header and, and kind of try to, to trick uh, AWS. No, you have to make sure that it's encrypted, right? Like I said, it's one of the use cases. You can have a uh, host static, you can uh, host the data um, bucket, um, host the website, and you can store all the assets, right? All the HTML files, CSS, all the images that you're using in the website and simply enable hosting, website hosting. And you will be provided, you will be provided with a URL, right? That you can utilize. I know this is not in the scope of this presentation, but I'm just giving you a uh, kind of a more, a little more information about uh, what you can do with S3. And finally, versioning, just in case, just in case you want to um, secure your data even more, you can enable versioning, which is not enabled by default. You can enable versioning, and then it will create a version ID for that object that you upload, right? It means that when you upload a, version, uh, a, a, a file, you're going to have that file and a version of that file. So it means that if you transform and you change that file, you upload it again, it will overwrite that file in, in the main section of the of the bucket, but it will create another version of that uh, of that file. So you will have some sort of a version control. So it means that if you want to revisit an old version of that file, you can still use uh, the previous version of that, right? Which is pretty cool for. Um, protecting your, 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 your files. Because if someone tries to delete the file uh, from the main section of the bucket, you still keep that version. So the version is not deleted, right? Now, once the version is enabled, you cannot disable it, right? You can't. You can suspend it, but there's no way to disable it, right? So you suspend it. It means that at some point, you will have to enable it again or unsuspend it, right? So this is all about S3. Um, I hope it was a very informative section of this office hour today. Uh, we try to compile as much information, as much relevant information as we could, right? To be able to guys uh, offer offer you, um, you know, something meaningful related to the datathon. Again, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and uh, and uh, and post in the chat or ask, and 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 I will I will. Easel is taking over now. Go ahead, Easel. You can take over, and uh, and I will take care of the chat if you have any questions. All right, thank you, Danieski. That was an excellent presentation. Um, so can you guys see my screen? Just give me a thumbs up if you can. All right, great. Awesome. So, the, um, so for the datathon, um, we'll be providing accounts for you, uh, for you folks. So, uh, I think, uh, I believe there's like five per per account. So um, uh, the day of the dayathon, we'll uh, actually go through how to access uh, those accounts and uh, how to log in into them. But uh, I just wanted to cover, you know, at a very, very high level, how uh, what you would expect when you see um, the AWS console for the first time. So um, as soon as you log in 
um, either using your um, your uh, username and password. Um, this is what you will typically see on the launch page. So this is um, the UI version, just like what uh, Danieski mentioned. You can um, access the AWS console, or you can access the AWS platform using the AWS console or the CLI or the or using the SDK if you're running uh, any Python libraries. You can. There's uh, multiple ways to access the uh, AWS platform. So I'm just going to cover the, the AWS console just to guide, uh, get you guys comfortable on what to expect, because there is a lot of details, a lot of services going around, and um, it's good to know how everything works. So when you first log in, this is going to be your console homepage, and this is where you will see um, different widgets. So there's a couple of widgets that are there by default, and you can, um, you know, remove these widgets or change these sizes. But for example, the recently visited widget is basically all the services that uh, you recently visited, and they're all uh, cached in your, in your cookies. You can also see a bunch of like, uh, you know, training and certifications, uh, getting started with AWS, uh, and even what's new. You can also see uh, the AWS Health to see if there's any open issues on um, your account, and also the cost usage of some of the services that um, you'll be using. So, for example, if you have um, Amazon Simple Storage, you have some data in the S3, uh, you will see a forecast of that and the amount that's being charged. And uh, there's uh, many other widgets you can um, check out, which is be very helpful. Now. <clears throat> If you go to the upper uh, navigation bar, you'll see a couple of things here. Um, first, you'll see the actual user or role that you're uh, being um, logged into as. So for example, I'm logged in here as for a particular user called participant role, but this will typically be your, um, you know, your username. If you're logging into your own personal account, this will be your user that you create through uh, identity and access management, IM which is a service that you can have full control of the users um, that access the, you know, your account. So here, this will be your account number for that particular account that you're uh, logging into. And you can actually go to um, check out different settings for the account, the organization that you're in. Um, if you want to check out some of the service quotas that are you and you can increase service quotas. Uh, if needed, and also the billing dashboard. Now, uh, Danieski covered uh, regions and availability zones. So this is what you will typically see in the console. So by default, this will be the region um, that you're currently using, for example, Ohio, but you can actually go and navigate to many other regions and select them if needed. So um, if you want to work with the US East 1 region, you can just select that and it will be available for you for that. And there's multiple regions that are available to you. If you want to check out the European regions, um, South America, like Brazil, and um, other regions also, <clears throat> such as um, Europe, Middle East, uh, Israel, and other regions. So these are all the regions that are available to you. So depending on your workload, um, and what services you want to launch within those regions. Um, if you want to run like a highly available app, you want to run like a data um, data analytics pipeline, you would typically um, you select the region that is closest to your users. OK, now <clears throat> here is the actual search bar where you can actually search for uh, the services that you're interested in. So for example, if you want to search for Amazon simple storage, S3, you can actually uh, select that. <laughs> and uh, also, you you can go through the services page here, and you can actually see the different types of um, services that are grouped or clustered together in a different, uh, different by different ca category. So uh, services related to analytics would be shown here. Services related to, uh, for example, database, um, developer tools, blockchain, uh, Internet of Things, they're all um, will be available to you here. So, I want to check out storage services. These are all the storage services that you can use. Um, 
such as uh, S3, S3 Glacier, and things of that sort. So this is gives you that flexibility. Okay, now before we actually dive in into uh, to S3, I just wanted to talk about um, what you will be, uh, you know, what you might see in the datathon itself. So um, if you're going to be working on open data, so open data is, um, you know, a third party, you know, third party data sets where you have data sets that are available to you. And this is um, what Danielski mentioned. This is like basically the gesture of all the data sets that you can have access to. And from here, you can actually um, so you can actually search for a particular data set. So I actually already did search for that, but um, this is the actual page, and I can I'll put it in the chat here so you guys can check it out. So here you can actually uh, find any type of data sets that might be applicable to you that might, you might be interested in. Um, I know there's several data sets, just like, um, for example, like the common crawl, where basically it's a data set of the whole internet and it gets crawled every month. And it's, it's very popular for uh, machine learning and natural language processing. But um, here you have the capability of actually searching for it. So, for example, if you want to search for COVID-19 uh, data, that you can actually um, check out this data set here and it'll give you a description of that data set itself what it is um, who it's, um, who it's, uh, it's owned by you know how often it gets updated frequently so this one gets updated per periodically and also there's some important um, important details about the data set itself uh, such as um, where the you know where it's located. So we know that this data set is actually located in the U.S. East two region, right? And also how we can access that. Now these data sets within Open Data is they're made for the public. So if you want to access them, you can access them from anywhere. So you can access them from um, well, typically you can access them from the the CLI. So you can actually run this command on your CLI and it will actually list those data sets or you can actually browse if the, the particular data set, who, whoever owns that data set has that available to you, to you can actually browse those data sets and, and then go through them and see what is interesting or something that might be of interest to you. So um, as you can see here, they have they categorized it in CSV and JSON and they have uh, different countries, things of that sort. So you can actually have that ability to uh, import that, copy that over to S3. OK, so um, I'm going to pause here if there's any questions when it comes to open data. And this is the data registry that most likely might be use, using, depending on the region that you're in. So just make sure um, um, whatever region you select has support for that data set. All right, sounds cool, cool. So um, that is the open data. So there's also another way where you can access um, this data set is actually through the, uh, if you explore the catalog itself, where you can actually um, find many more data sets that might be of interest. So here we have, um, uh, this is through the marketplace, which is, which shows you the, this is actually the data exchange. And this just shows, just shows you all the different types of uh, data sets. You can filter by the affiliated program, such as the open data sponsorship program, where you can see, um, like I mentioned, like the common crawl, you can see this data set um get some documentation about it um you know how frequently it's updated things of that sort and also the the, the bucket that's is actually stored in so right now this this data is actually stored in this s3 bucket called uh, common crawl all right so now talking about s3 so we already know um 
Uh, Denise already talked about uh, some of the services, uh, and he mentioned S3. So, you know, S3 is basically, um, it's basically just a storage service. So you can store basically unlimited data. Um, you know, you can store mission critical data, um, and it offers that, um, you know, 99.119's durability. And what's cool about S3 is that it has features like, you know, storage management, you can apply lifecycle rules, um, you can have object locks to prevent um, deletion or files overwritten through that data set. Now, these data are actually stored in what we call a bucket. So in order to actually um, have that data available, you would need to create a bucket. So you would go in the S3 console, and then you can create a bucket here. So when you create a bucket, it basically is just a container. So think of it as a container of all your data. So I already have a uh, bucket that is available that I already created, and it has, um, you can say, you can consider them different folders. And within each folder, you can have your, uh, you know, data sets um, stored in here. So you can have, um, you know, some of that data sets there. So basically, um, in, in through the console, it just makes it more easier to visualize and easier, but you can always use the, the CLI or the, or the SDK to actually, um, you know, list those S3 buckets, copy them, um, delete those uh, objects within those buckets and, and so forth. OK, now. This is S3 and uh, this is just at a high level, you know, I know we just don't have time to cover everything, all the features of, uh, of S3, but just to show you guys like just at a high level what you might expect when it comes to data analytics. So um, S3 is most likely the service that you're going to be using to, um, for that. Now, if we go back to the home page itself, um, now we can actually, um, we can, let me show you guys the the, C, the, the CLI. So if you want to, let's say, um, you know, you're interested in the you know, COVID data set here. Um, you know, you're looking, you're browsing, you're kind of curious. You want to go um, and check out this data set, right? You want to list it. So you can actually just with ease, you can just copy this command, right? And actually come here to the console and open a shell terminal. So this is the cloud shell, which you can run um, commands or Linux commands on that shell. And it's just going to prepare your terminal. Um, and then you can just basically run this command and it will list all the all the the folders, right? The folders in that data set and see if so, something might be of interest to you. So this is just to visualize that you can actually use the command line interface to to get that data set. Now, if you don't want to use the cloud shell, this is actually provided by AWS. You can actually use, uh, you know, a browser based IDE. Or you can actually use your own um, Visual Studio code for that. So we have something called Cloud9. Now within Cloud9, um, you can launch instances. So these instances could be, um, you know, basically Linux instances. You can call them like a, you can call them like a jump box. Where can you actually use that as a um, as an IDE instead of Visual Studio Code? So if you're, if you don't want to um, use um, your local IDE, you can actually run an ID on the cloud. And this is called uh, Cloud9. So it's basically, you know, a typical IDE that you could use and you can actually come in and, um, you know, run different commands here, um, which might be of interest. So the same command that we actually copied over, you can run it here and you'll have that. So you can actually, uh, it's basically Linux guys. So um, you can do what you want to do here. Okay. And um, I already have some data sets that I copied over from some, uh, I think it was uh, COVID-19 COVID data sets. Um, and uh, let's see if I can actually run. Let me see if I can open that. Yeah, so this is some of the data sets that I actually have here um, that you can use. So you can actually, um, you know, it's just basically a terminal if you guys are I love going through the terminal. So 
uh, that's one way. Now, I want to also jump into uh, some of the data analytics services that are important. So um, Cloud9 is might be useful for you guys, but also I think one important service that um, you know we'll quickly cover just at a high level is actually AWS Glue. Okay. So AWS Glue is a serverless uh, service for ETL um, extract, transform, and load. So any type of ETL workloads that you have uh, with that data set. So um, if you think, let's say if um, you copy a particular data set from the open data uh, public S3 bucket, you copied it into your personal bucket, then you would want to uh, clean that data, right? Transform that data. So you would you can use you know a service like Glue that makes it more easier to actually uh, uh, you know do those ETL jobs. Okay, so um, I know there's a lot going on in this uh, interface here, but this is just the UI interface. You can you can run this through the SDK or the CLI, like I mentioned before, but it's actually pretty pretty um, pretty simple. It's not that difficult to understand. So here, this is going to be your ETL jobs. So if you have any type of ETL workload that you want to do, like cleansing the data, you want to transform that data, you would typically um, go through this here. So this actually is the AWS Glue Studio. And from here, you can actually um, run those jobs. And you can run those jobs using a, um, you know, a visual canvas if you want to. If you're not more, uh, you know, you're not that technical, you just want something visually seen, you can do the, um, you can use the visual canvas and I'll show you guys how that works. Uh, or you can actually um, create a Jupyter Notebook. So you can create a Jupyter Notebook or you can upload your existing notebook to actually run those ETL jobs and it will actually um, transform that data for you. So uh, I'm going to show you two ways. So I'm going to show you uh, at a high level the visual canvas for uh, people that are not really that technical that they don't want to um, run Spark or Python code. And I'll show you the, um, the Jupyter Notebook. So I already have them created. And it's easy to create. You just come here and just create the notebook and just click on create. As simple as that. And it'll create that notebook for you. And then you just put in um, the required uh, things. Um, now, let's actually open one of these notebooks. So um, this is one of the notebook that I created. And remember, guys, uh, I think I didn't mention is that when you uh, create these notebooks, you, you might be asked for a role. Right. And a role is basically just the permissions that allow you to access a particular service. So, um, you know, you would you typically you would have um, least privilege. This is a security um, thing that you have to uh, put in mind is that um, if you want to launch anything within the AWS environment, you have to have permissions to that. You have to have, uh, you know, maybe a role to actually have access to those services. And this is just one of the best security pack practices when it comes to that. So just make sure in mind that um, we study up a little bit on IM, identity and access management, because it's, uh, it's actually important when it comes to um, having policies around these services, who gets access to what and things of that sort. But this is typically um, a notebook. So this might be familiar to you guys. It's just like uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Where you can come in, um, you know, you can import libraries th through, uh, you know, PySpark, and actually run those jobs to, uh, you know, do those extract, transform, and load. And um, it's 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 you know really um, it makes it really easy to actually run this. And if you don't want to see the notebook itself, you can click on the scripts here, and it actually goes through uh, the script. OK, I know we are running out of time. We only have uh, five minutes left, but um, you know, this is just at a high level. I wanted to cover some of the cool things that you could do. Um, uh, this is the visual canvas. I just want to show you guys this before um, we end. But um, but in, in the next uh, office hour sessions, we can either dive deep into more of glue or we can actually check out uh, you know, SageMaker because that's um, also very, very important when it comes to AI ML. And um, I think you guys might be interested in that. So this is 
the the visualization portion of running ETL jobs. So, you know, like I said, I have a bucket. Remember, I have a bucket that I already created and I copied some of the uh, some of those data sets right into that bucket. So I come in here and actually I can, you know. Um, have, you know, transform that data, you know, evaluate it, fill in the missing data, do, do all this, all sorts of ETL jobs. Um, and then basically go through this pipeline. So imagine this as a pipeline. And then at the end of the day, um, once this pipeline is run, so once you run this job, it will actually have your clean data set and you can target that data set or have a target um, of that data to be uh, stored into S3. So stored into your account. And then you can use that S3 uh, or that data for um, machine learning purposes, right? You can import it into a, a SageMaker Jupyter Notebook where you can run your AI ML workloads there, and then you can have a, um, you know, something to uh, showcase, something for inference. So this is basically at a high level. Um, we didn't cover data catalogs or data in, uh, integration, but um, I would highly recommend, um, you know, you know, we have some um, YouTube videos out there, um, you know, just to quickly glance at Glue and how you can create data catalogs. Uh, I wanted to show you guys how to query that, but I don't have, we don't have time, but it's really important um, where you can actually query your data set. Um, so uh, if you want to have some sort of queries, you can actually have that uh, available. So for example, uh, I want to say, I want to view that data, right? So you can view that data through um, Athena. Athena is actually one, one of the um, services. Again, Amazon Athena is one of the services that you can actually run your query. So you can actually run and see, OK, the data set that I have. I have so any data set that's stored in S3 will be in Athena. You can run it in Athena and you can actually query that. So this is actually really cool. And you can run SQL-like statements. Um, so imagine you can run SQL-like statements in S3 to actually query that data that's stored in S3. So this is for visualization. And you could take it up a level if you want to visualize it using your own BI tools like Tableau or QuickSight, you can do that as well. So whatever um, um, if you, whatever fits um, your need. OK, so we only have one minute left. I know this is a lot of information, guys, but I just want to show you guys just at a high level how everything Will, might look like when you encounter this, but feel free just to uh, go over those resources. We'll be sending those resources over um, just to check them, you know, just to fill out that knowledge gap. And we all have more office hour sessions to uh, cover more interesting uh, things. I'll pass it back to Danieski uh, to close it off. And thank you, guys. Thank you, Hazel. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Pretty good. Um, yeah, that's all we have for today, folks. Uh, does anyone have any questions before we finish today? Or maybe, Sean, you want to say something before we finish today? Is Sean on? Yeah, we, we have another training webinar, so I think he may have switched to the other one. Okay. Um, everyone who's here, there's another training webinar right after this. Um, for next week's AWS office hours, we will send you the connection details via email, just like this one. So keep an eye out on your inbox. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So there's one person with their hands raised. Macaulay? Yeah, that's me. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, OK. Uh, thank you for the uh, interesting presentation. I hadn't realized that the data tunnel was highly <laughs> Highly dependent on AWS. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was just in my mind. I was like, okay, I was already thinking of all the um, 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 just uh, com combined programming and uh, data visualization uh, packages and whatever, and try to put something up. So um, within the limited time we have, it, it looks like um, uh, AWS is interesting, but um, it's the, I mean, there's there's so much that it's it's just a lot in there. So um <laughs> so essentially between now and um in just uh, roughly a month or so, well mm -hmm. um that was like a very limited time to take some time mm -hmm. out to really get co uh, confident with that AWS platform. Right, right. So um Okoli, can I call you Okoli? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So what I 
Iso, can you see me? Because I don't see myself. Can you see me? Yeah, I can see you. This is so weird. I cannot see myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know if the camera is on or off. Um, Okali, so I don't know if the UN has access to the skill builder uh, from AWS. So that's something that we have to find out. But AWS offers courses AWS for free. Offer Course of a free, uh, like for to customers that have uh, some sort of subscription with the skill builder, and then there you can find courses, and we can send the link as well to introduction to data analytics and probably to uh, for beginners uh, how to understand the cloud as well, the AWS cloud and the other AWS platform. So that's something that you guys, probably Sean or Clarence, you can find out about that, or probably someone in your department can tell you about that but i know right, that we'll, from we'll the un yep. that, yeah that customers that have access to the skill builder yep and, and uh, can, Okoli, uh yeah. i mean aws is a great tool but it's I mean, not AWS required to um to process data or to do anything in the datathon so um you can use your mm -hmm. own tools as well and the okay, oh, you own data set, you own data sets as well. We don't have to. Yeah. The open data registry is for you guys to have an open source uh, data to use, right? Like a, like a place to go to, but you can use your own data as long as it's not as it is not confidential data. Essentially, so essentially, the use of AWS is optional. I, I can use my own. Um, um, I can use uh, the, the open. The data will be released to us. Uh, we can combine our own. Um, tools, uh, yes. programming languages, or any other uh, data science tools or visualization packages, put all of right. that together and, 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 uh, and achieve the, the uh, whatever we're told to do in the data tone, do that and submit. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, I remember just, right. Uh, us and our partners, including AWS, we just want to make all the tools available to you to, so you can make okay. the best product that you can, but nothing right. is required. Yeah. Whatever you yeah. feel comfortable uh, with, whatever okay. you feel comfortable so, with. Yeah. So uh, um, the good you, thing. Uh, okay, so um, um, are, are, are you uh, are using or not using AWS is not going to um be sort of like a criteria in the assessment no. process. No. But the good thing about AWS is that you don't have to pay for it. I don't know what what tools you're using, um, but maybe there's a cost to the tools you're using. Maybe there's not. But with AWS, there's no cost to you. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Anyone else? Does anyone else have any questions? We still have 20, 20, about I 23 think, uh, at the next year. Week, we can evaluate and maybe choose like the, the next office hour session, whatever you guys feel um, you want to learn more about. Just uh, let us know. That would be great. So we can uh, cover that. We yeah. still have a month away, so. Yes. So don't, yeah. Uh, I'll call it, okay. All right. So if there's no more questions, I think uh, we are. Uh, I'll call it, you have another question? You will see your hands. Yep. Your hand is raised again. Oh, sorry. Let me put it down. Let me lower my hand. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, yeah. So uh, it's that's all on our end. Uh, Clarence, if you want to say something, uh, kind yep. of dismisses. Thanks. Uh, Thanks everyone for coming to these office hours. Um, again, just keep an eye out on your inbox this week for the connection details for next week's office hours. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right. Thanks everybody. Bye. See you guys. Bye. -bye. Bye.